Uh, so let me let me clarify. I never worked for the CIA. I did not consult for them. Uh, I was I went through the application process. I was asked to apply. Uh, I got to the point of a conditional offer of employment, and at that point. Uh, understanding fully what I would be asked to do and how my life would change. Uh, I think rightfully so decided it wasn't for me. Big fan of the agency. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are in it. Uh, and I have, uh, I have to phrase this in a, in the correct way. I have, I have, uh, done my civic duty, uh, in interesting ways. Is how I is how I will put that. Uh, with that being said, every for me, there's a hard stop. All of these techniques, all of these tools, uh, when you become a spy, when you become an officer, and you go through training at the farm, one of the classes you take is. You know, it's called trade craft. It's what you learn. Uh, and currently, I don't know about the past, what you learn is magic. All right. Today we are joined by Michael Gutenplan, who is, okay, you describe yourself as a third generation psychic. So let's start there. First, how are you doing? And second, what is a third generation psychic? I'm doing great. That was quick. Uh, <laughs> it was a record year for me, so I'm super. I'm feeling really good. It's been my uh, uh, financially and, and show wise best year in the last 23 years of doing this. Third generation psychic. So there, there are two parts to my performance persona: the magician, mentalist, performer. First generation. My my father and my grandfather are not performers. The psychic part is we believe as a family in intuition, ESP, the idea that there's a universe and you are given signs and things can happen. Uh, we don't talk to the dead. We don't do that. We don't necessarily believe in that. Uh, what we believe in is that we all have heightened senses of intuition, of instinct, and that it's a muscle. And the more you use it, the stronger it gets. And it's just... Uh, I'm third generation because my father and my grandfather really believe uh, in ESP as as kind of a, a thing. Uh, my grandfather's uncle won the Irish sweepstakes, which was kind of a national un uh, lottery in the, I think it was 1929, brought the whole family out of Poland just in time. So I think that kind of started the whole uh, we have it mentality as a family. Uh, we have a distant relative called Wolf Messing, who was a famous mentalist in uh, Stalinist Russia, believe it or not. Uh, and he was a, a, a famous uh, performer and, you know, mystic to Stalin. We don't really talk about that part. Uh, but it's it really it's it's not a uh, it's not a made up thing. It's an actual third generation. Uh, my grandfather believes in it. Uh, he sends me stuff behind me. I have a lot of stuff that he sends me and, and is always uh, pushing this idea that we have, they're not supernatural abilities. They're abilities that every single person has. You just have to listen to them and hone them and work that muscle. Okay. So I'm going to immediately push on it a little bit just because yeah. what you're getting into sort of supernatural, but not supernatural. So I, I definitely want to clarify on that. And, you know, I think of people like Yuri Geller. Mm -hmm. And where would you place that? Because Yuri Geller kind of represented himself as mind reader, psychic, and not a mentalist. I and, have, and by uh, I have a book somewhere here. There's a book. Uh, I don't know where I put it all about Uri Geller. Uh, it just came out. It's a, it's a phenomenal book uh, called Bend It Like Geller. It talks about his techniques and essays about him. Here, here's my feeling on Uri Geller. Controversial figure because he spends an entire career saying this is real, this is real, this is real. And then currently he says it's real depending on how you want to look at it. I think he's incredible, and I think he's incredible for one reason, which is 
He inspires people. He doesn't say to them, uh, believe me wholeheartedly, this is what it is. He says, isn't this incredible? Isn't this amazing? Uh, there were times where he crossed the line. There were times where he made some bad choices in terms of things he promoted or said. But the idea of uh, collective unity, hoping for the best, I don't have a problem with. That's not who we are. Uh, I do want to clarify, third generation psychic is a family thing. I am a, I am a mentalist entertainer. Two different things, and I, and I make that clear in the at the end of the show, which is as much as I want everything to be on stage to be real, uh, it is in a show environment. And even though it is real within the confines of a show, there are things that I'm doing that can only be done on stage within that specific control. So it's real, but real in a very specific place. And I think for, there, there's like three levels. There's the showman, which is we're coming into a theater, we're watching a show, and in that space, this is real. I don't care if you're making an elephant appear, reading minds, it's real. Because it's in a show, you're in a theater, you bought a ticket. The, the next level is kind of the Uri Geller world, which is maybe it's real, maybe it's not. I, I leave it to you. Isn't this amazing? There's a little bit of magic. There's a lot of showmanship. Uh it's veering more towards the real side, and but but there's still that kind of ambiguity, am, ambiguous nature of it where you can challenge it. There's the third side, which is I'm speaking to the dead. You have a curse. Give me money. Uh, I am a psychic, and I'm predicting the future, and you're in trouble, and give me money. Uh, I'm a psychic. I'm going to cure your cancer with a touch. Give me money. That's, for me, the line. Uh, as long as there's a showmanship aspect to it, I'm fine with it. When it becomes predatory, I always say there's a, people come up to me after my show, they say, I, I, I've seen a medium, they talk to my father, what do you think? And I say, if it's for closure, if it's for closure and it's a one-time thing, totally fine with me. I have no problem with that. That's a personal choice. If the psychic says, and then you need to come back, we need to clear something, we need to go further, that's the line. It's no longer for fun. You're now being told we need more money. So I do think there are red lines for me, and it is when it becomes predatory. For a lot of people in the magic world, the red line is this is all fake. Anything else is predatory. I disagree with that personally. I think Uri Geller... Uh, is in that middle space, which is, is it real? Is it not? It doesn't really matter. You're having fun. Okay. I think that, I think my friend Spidey, uh, behavioral arts and Spidey hypnosis, et cetera. I'd, he probably falls on the last one you mentioned, which is, this is a trick. I am tricking you. You're coming to a show and I'm not reading your mind. I am manipulating the situation to get a result for entertainment value. But it's 100% not psychic. It, I, I'm, you know, through sleight of hands or other means or math or different um, tools, he's coming to a result. So where would you put yourself in that spectrum between, let's say, Spidey yeah. and Yuri? Um I'm in the, I'm, I'm, I'm a mixture of the two. So I would say I, in my show, I am in a sparkly, very colorful suit with, with crystal studded shoes. Uh, I am jumping up and down like an idiot, you know, ah, while I'm doing a serious mind reading show. Uh, I don't make any claims that it's a show. I don't make any claims that it's all psychological. I say what you are seeing is real. Be and, and my justification for that is when you watch a movie, they don't have a, a, a disclaimer that comes on the front and says, everybody you're seeing is an actor. This is not really Oppenheimer. This is not really Barbie, keeping it current. You watch it and you go, okay, I'm watching a movie. I know these are actors, but for the two and a half, three hours that I'm in this, everything is real. I'm going to believe it. And then when I when it shuts off, I walk out and I go on. I, I went to school. Well, that's just saying a willing, to, to, a willing um, suspension, suspension of, of disbelief. 
Yeah. You you paid for a ticket. You can't, you willfully chose to come in here. Therefore, it's a show. Uh, I think I fall in the middle because uh, I don't have a disclaimer. I don't say, you know, there's trickery involved. But I think the difference between me and someone like Uri Geller is if you come up to me after the show and you go, that was amazing. Was that real? I say, yes, but. Not yes and. Yes, but. It can only be done on this stage. I have complete control. I do believe, honestly, that we have abilities as humans that we don't explore. Uh, and I very clearly say, it is done on this stage. You can't go out into the public and bend a fork. You can't go out into the public and say, think of something I know what you're thinking of. It doesn't work like that, but it does work on the stage. So there is truth in the artifice. It is a show, clearly a show. Uh, that is my, my suit and my jumping up and down is my disclaimer. Uh, if you walk out of there and you say, boy, that guy's got some amazing abilities. Uh, I don't think you're then going to become a spiritualist and join the church spiritually and talk to the dead. That's not what my show does. What my show does is it says, uh, if you walk into a gas station and you have a feeling that that lottery ticket's a winner, go for it. What the heck? It's not put all your money on red. Uh, there, there, and I do think there's a difference. I think Sometimes for uh, someone like Uri, it is put it all on red. Trust yourself. Go with it. What's the worst that can happen? For me, it's put a 20. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's let's find that happy medium. Uh, I have I have issues with emotional psychics. So uh, 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 James Van Pra or the Long Island Medium, someone who is using your emotions to create entertainment. And I very carefully constructed a show um, that doesn't get personal. Uh, you know, I really don't want an audience. Uh, when, when you go to see a psychic show, you're a little scared. What is this person going to say? Are they going to know what I'm thinking? Uh, I did a show in Washington, D.C. once at a country club, and there were four people there. And I said, what the, what the hell happened? They go, well, you did really well at this other country club, and word spread. And a lot of the people in our in our uh, membership didn't want you to know what they were thinking. you know. And I went, I went well, that says a lot about this group, but it, that's, that's, a, that's scary for people. So I, I, very, I do think that there is a, a line in terms of what you reveal. Uh, so superficial, keep uh, it superficial to a degree. Yeah. Think, think of a celebrity, think of a card that don't, don't think of your pin code. I, 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 when I see a magician or a mentalist say your pin code is one, two, three, four, I go, now this person has to go change their pin code, you know, and they use that more than just for their bank. They're using that for every single four digit code in their light. You know, uh, th there's a, uh, there's a whole there's a whole world of phone magic, right? I'm going to open up your phone. I know what you're thinking. Oh, I got your pin code. When I borrow someone's phone for for an effect, for an experiment, for an effect, I, I say you open it, and I and I very purposely hold it in front of them so that they can see what I'm doing. I don't want them to think that I'm going through their files. Um, mm -hmm. Now take that to the next level, which is you came to see my show and I go, um, I want you to think of your mother. And you go, my, my mother's name is Barbara. I don't know. And you go, Barbara, your mother's name is Barbara. You go, all of a sudden it goes from this is fun to this is a little personal. Now I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. My show is fun. And I think that is part of the disclaimer. You're laughing. You're having a good time. You're not sitting there going, Oh my goodness, he's in my psyche. Okay, um, that was a, that while was a you were, thirty minute explanation. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> while you were talking to Pete, um, you brought up something I thought was interesting, and this is uh, my good friend Pete Turner, who has helped book some guests like yourself. You had mentioned that you like to 
browse jewelry stores and high-end merchandise and things like that. Is that for this purpose? Like, nobody's going to feel too personally attacked if you comment on the Rolex and say, oh, you know, that's a particular model and that tells you something about them and you can maybe go down that path. So the greatest skill set a mentalist can have, and, and I'll say this, anyone, not a mentalist, any person can have is the ability to talk about anything, anything at all. Mm -hmm. Bring up a subject. I can at least go one level, if not two, to make you think, well, that this guy knows what I'm talking about. He may not know, Michael may not know details, but he can start the conversation. I can fake it till I make it kind of thing. And I, I'm constantly reading, I'm constantly looking for things where I go, oh, that's going to come up. But I believe that's part of the universe. The universe is saying, hey, here's an article about, uh, you know, this specific tort law. I'll give you an example. And I was doing a show. I said, what do you do for a living? Guy goes, I'm a lawyer. He goes, I go, what kind of lawyer? He goes, ah, you've never heard of it. It's called tort law. And I go, oh, I've been to the museum. You know, and he goes, Connecticut? I go, yeah. And, uh, you know, what's his name's museum? Oh, my God. I believe the universe puts those things together. One thing I do is I, as you just said, I go into jewelry stores, I'll walk down, I live in Los Angeles, I'll walk down Beverly Hills and I'll look in all the stores. I'll look in Cartier, uh, Van Cleef, and I'll say, okay, this is, this is the classic Hermes bracelet. This is the classic uh, Cartier bracelet. These are, these are Van Cleef necklaces. The most powerful thing you can do is remember someone's name, and comment on something specific. Don't say those are great earrings. Say to them, oh my God, are those Van Cleef? Those are beautiful. Because now you know something. So when I when I do my shows and I comment, I, you know, you, you, you don't say, oh, that looks great. You go, the, those Louboutins are fabulous. And they, and they go, oh my God, you noticed. Because they're expensive. They, they know you noticed the piece of jewelry. Uh, watches men's watches if you see someone wearing a rolex you go great watch if you see, see someone wearing a paddock you go that paddock is amazing i, I have to, i just had to stop you and talk that guy will look at you and go wow you know what you're talking about uh wines if uh when i do i do a lot of dinner shows country clubs and stuff i'll walk around the table and i'll find a table that has a good bottle of wine and i'll say that is a great year that's a great bottle and they go oh my gosh you know i go how do you not stop and say that to someone? All of a sudden, you're speaking their language. You're complimenting their taste. You're complimenting specifics about what they're doing. And you're starting the conversation. Uh, and you do it with various things. I'll even do it with a steak. I'll go, did you order that steak like that? You go, yeah, yeah, medium rare. I go, it's always nice to know someone who knows how to order a steak. Yeah, are you kidding me? Um, it's called building rapport. You're, you're finding similarities between you and the other person. And it's the greatest tool anybody can use to get in past that outer circle, starting to get into that center circle. The center circle is where they reveal everything. You said something I thought was interesting there, too, about um, Just you having a wide... Only one. It, it, there is a quota here. It's rationing compliments. Um you are essentially describing being a mile wide and an inch deep. Yep. And isn't that sometimes actually good to not have a super in-depth piece of knowledge because that allows the person you're speaking to to teach you and feed you information? For example, your tort guy. You're going to run out of subjects very quickly when you're getting into tort law, right? But if you say, I went to the museum, oh, yeah, such and such a museum, and be like, well, what's one of your favorite exhibits? And then you can put it on them to entertain you. Lawn darts. Now, always an answer. Uh, <laughs> okay. Lawn darts. There Lawn you go. darts. Uh, tort, by the way, anybody who's like, what, what the hell is tort law? I remember. Tort law is when you see stupid uh, warnings, this bag is not a toy. Uh, this is not a food, uh, caution. This coffee is hot. That's tort law. It's the law mm -hmm. where you, uh, you weren't, it, it was dangerous to the consumer without a warning, uh, basically. Yep. Uh, and it's Ralph Nader. Do, do, do not remove this label from this mattress. Correct. Correct. So there's an entire museum of, uh, tort law where it has all the labels that Ralph Nader and his people, uh, forced you to put on, including this is hot coffee and all that. Uh, I, I think 
yes, what you said, a hundred percent. You don't, you know, you want to leave it broad. Um, I, I've, I've learned that people like to be smart. People like to teach. So, uh, people will say, uh, what kind of law do you, tort law? Oh, I've been to the museum. Oh, wow. Uh, usually it ends there because then they want to, they, they either want to go away. Okay. This guy knows a bit too much or what they'll say. It, they will, they'll never say like, what was your favorite exhibit? But they'll say, uh, you know, I worked on this case. And then you just have to let the, everybody wants to be the teacher. Everybody wants to give you information. So if you express interest in something rather than testing you, most people will give you. Um, and then you just take that little bit of information they give you and you can turn it around and, and keep the conversation going. So um, I did a project where there were military people. It was another DC show. And one of the people there was a... He did something on an aircraft carrier or a submarine with nuclear stuff. And I, and I kind of knew enough about that, the world of submarines, uh, where I said, ah, oh, the silent service. And he goes, yeah, yeah, the silent service. And I said, you know, I had, a, I had talked to a guy. Once. So I want saying I know the world. I said, you know, I talked to a guy once and he talked about um, the greatest thing that he loved was fresh air and fresh fruit. And that, because it was a memory for him, sparked the conversation. He goes, oh, my God, the fresh, the, the fruit, the fruit. I couldn't, I can't eat canned fruit for the rest of my life. I hate canned fruit. Uh, so I'm not talking about what he does for a job. I'm talking about an emotional element uh, that he then goes, oh, this guy gets it. He knows something about that life, and then he can teach me. Uh, so it's not always the business. It's finding something in the world of that creates that connection that can get. It's always getting to that next level closer to this guy's a friend. This guy's on the inside. Um, you know, he, this guy's a friend of ours. Let him, you know, bring him in. Give him the discount. Uh, so anything you can manipulates a dirty word, but anything you can manipulate to make them feel like you really understand, not know what you're talking about, but understand. So it starts with jewelry. It starts with a pin. It starts with, oh, is that a Freemason's pin? Oh, are you a Freemason? Well, I'm not, uh, but dot, 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 dot. Uh, oh, uh, are you a Mormon? I'm not, but you know, I did the tour in Salt Lake and I have a friend and, oh, really? That's interesting. You know, you know, are you a Scientologist? Well, I'm not, but, uh, you know, I, I went into a class and I spoke to someone and I think those books are so interesting. You know, anything you, you want to keep the conversation going. Think of, think of rapport, think of relationships like a spiral and you're starting on that outside and all you're doing is following that little path until boom, I got to that center point where you go, I can tell this guy anything. I can trust them. They know me. They are a friend. And the better you are at it, the quicker you can do it. So you want to be able to do it in a classy way. A, it, it's, it can happen within minutes, but it has to be smooth. You can't jump to that center spot. You have to kind of massage and, again, manipulate this conversation to be exactly where you need. And Things like tricks like, um, you know, the shirt you're wearing or the earphones or the thing, you know, if, if we were doing this, I would look behind you and I would see R2-D2 and I'd say, okay, this guy is into Star Wars. Let me, what do I know about Star Wars? And I'd bring it up and I'd probably do it as a joke and you'd go, oh, like Star Wars. And then I'd try to look at the books behind you and, okay, how do I get to be this guy's friend? How do I show him that we're the same so that you can make a comment that I can bounce off of, that I can bounce off of? And all of a sudden I'm letting you lead the conversation and I'm just going along with it till we get that point where you go, oh, this guy gets it. Now I can, now I can reveal what I'm really thinking. Um, okay, and that's when you have something to play with. Um, yeah. You know, like there, there is something. There's noticeable. always something to play with. There's always something. You just have to look. You have to be observant. Um, Phones are a great thing. When someone opens up their phone, their background tells them at all. so much about them or the apps they have. Um, the What's in their wallet can tell you so much about who they are. Um, where'd you grow up is a great question to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't say, where are you from? Because that can be offensive. Uh, if you're an immigrant or something, you know, I'm from LA. 
I've been here for 40 years. You know, no, no, no. Where'd you grow up? Oh, you grew up in uh, hmm. Iran. Oh, uh, Tehran. Oh, and now you go, okay, well, they, they left, which means they probably left when the Shah was there, you know, with the Shah situation. They're probably Persian Jews or Persian Christians, you know, and now you have something to go off of, observe it. So it's not just visual. It's asking pointed questions and knowing how to do it. What did you want to be when you were a kid is a great question. I like the uh, where did you grow up yep. question. That, that makes me think of one that celebrities always do, and I didn't realize it till later. They always say, nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Not uh, nice yeah. to meet you, but nice to see you, just in case they've run across this person before in their life. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you another one, which I get a lot. Uh, being an entertainer, someone will come up to me after the show. And in the world of magic and mentalism, you know, it is something you can, in essence, go to go to online, go to a magic shop at your local town, buy a trick, and for your friends, be the best magician they know. Truly, be the best magician they know. So I'll do a show, and Barbara or Bob will come up to me after and go, you know, we have a friend who's a magician. Do you know, or he's, we have a friend who's a member of the Magic Castle. They're really good. Do you know, you know, John Smith? And I don't go, who? I go, oh, I, you know, I think I know of him. I think he's really good, right? You're, you're saying, uh, yeah, I think I know who you're talking about without saying yes or no. Because then you get, you get that out. Like you were saying before, the question that comes after you, you're stopping that. I think I know who you're talking about. Um, the guy who's uh, yay tall and does, uh, <laughs> you know, no. I think I know who you're talking about, and I think they're really good. So now you've complimented their friendships. Uh, how is he doing? How are? How is she doing? Oh my god! I, you know, not put them on the phone. I want to say hello. They'll go. Who the hell is this? Um, a lot of times, someone will come up to you and they'll say, uh, "I saw a show on a cruise ship. Do you know so and so?" And you go, uh, "You know what? I don't. I don't know if I know them, but but it sounds like you had an incredible experience." Now you've changed it to them and they go, oh my goodness, when he did, you're still, they're still talking about their experience. They tell you their, the whole act and you go, that sounds so amazing. I'm so happy you, you had such an amazing experience, not I do the same thing. So it's always about them but in a way that puts them in a powerful position. The, the worst thing you can do is say, I don't know who you're talking about. They suck. You're an idiot. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, in the world of magic, it's, hey, can I show you a trick? And it's one of three tricks they learned on the back of a cereal box when they were 12 years old. Yeah, oh my God, that's amazing. You want me to show? No, 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 I like to be amazed. Don't tell me the secret. You know, huh, I complimented them, you know, uh, you go up to somebody and you say, uh, there, there's a good joke to do. If you want to, if you want to, if there's a guy who, who seems to be an alpha, right. And yet you, you have to get in with this group, but the guy's going to be a little blockish. You walk in there and you go, excuse me, uh, especially at a public event or, or an event, you go, uh, ex excuse me. Uh, there, there's been a lot of complaints about this table. Uh, so, uh, Eric, right? Eric, uh, the, a lot of the men here are jealous of you that, that you get to sit at this table with these beautiful people. And, uh, I, I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, you, you seem to be the luckiest guy here. And all of a sudden you start, you smile. Yeah. And then you make a joke and now you've broken that barrier and say, hey, just, I'm just, I'm just kidding with you, but Hey, seriously, nice job, buddy. And then you walk away and then you go, who the hell was that? And then I come back, you know, hey, and I go, ah, oh, yeah, I just wanted to make you look good. You know, I, you know, good job. Look, at, and you go, yeah, listen, this is my wife, 30 years. Take her, please. Uh, and, and all of a sudden you're in, you've made an inside joke that between the two of you, that person's going to open up to you. True. Now, I want to pivot on that point, because one thing that was brought up with you and Pete is Pete is he's very open about this. He's a spy, um, did government contracting work, uh, in the middle East and he did it while in the military. 
His whole goal is to find information. You seem to have consulted with the CIA, worked with the CIA, were somehow tied to the CIA at some point. And I want to circle back there because earlier you had mentioned, I don't want to get their pin code. In actuality, with the CIA and those type of figures, isn't that exactly kind of what you want? I'm going to have to censor this. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me let me clarify. I never worked for the CIA. I did not consult for them. Uh, I was I went through the application process. I was asked to apply. Uh, I got to the point of a conditional offer of employment, and at that point, uh, understanding fully what I would be asked to do and how my life would change, uh, I think rightfully so. Decided it wasn't for me big fan of the agency. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are in it. Uh, and I have, uh, I have to phrase this in a, in the correct way. I have, I have, uh, done my civic duty, uh, in interesting ways is how I, is how I will put that. Uh, with that being said, Every, for me, there's a hard stop. All of these techniques, all of these tools, uh, when you become a spy, when you become an officer and you go through training at the farm, one of the classes you take is, you know, it's called trade craft. It's what you learn. Uh, and currently, I don't know about the past, what you learn is magic. You learn sleight of hand, you learn manipulation, you learn pickpocketing, you learn uh, mentalism. All of these tools can be used to help you gain information. Uh, what's the difference between a cheat and a magician? Uh, you pay for the magician and the, the cheat, you just get it taken. The, the cheat gets shot when they get caught. Okay. Fair What's the difference between a spy and a magician? The spy gets imprisoned when they get caught. The magician goes, ha ha, you got me. The spy gets imprisoned and tortured. So there is, an, there is an added element to it. They're not learning a card trick. They are learning how to switch a, a piece of paper. They're learning how to do a dead drop and, and conceal. Uh, there is a book I have somewhere here. Uh, there was a book in the 19... Up here, uh, it's somewhere there. It's 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 the uh, manual of deception for the CIA. It was like a 1950s uh, manual for magic tricks in the CIA. Um, they still teach this. There's a there's a they have on retainer a specific performer who teaches pickpocketing and manipulation and magic and all this stuff. And it's a class they take. the The difference is. Uh, the best example I can give you actually is a show called The Carbonaro Effect. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's on True TV or was on True TV. Michael Carbonaro, uh, based off of his segments on the Jay Leno show, The Tonight Show, does magic organically in public. Okay? So uh, I have a cup. He takes a little peep, marshmallow peep, puts the peep under a cup, pulls it up. It's a It's a chicken. And he goes, yeah, this is the new peep, you know, it's a new marshmallow. And he makes a trick, but organically. That's actually how magic is used in tradecraft. Uh, you don't say, I want you to think of something, and then you switch it, and all of a sudden you know what they know. It becomes part of the conversation in a way that the other person doesn't realize something just happened. So it's the technique of magic, it's the technique of mentalism, it's the technique of pickpocketing uh, without the revelation that something happened. And uh, it's, it's, they, when you learn about cheating, right? A, a cheat doesn't do flourishes. They don't grab the cards and go, ooh, you would never know a cheat worked. So when a, when a spy or someone in intelligence does something related to magic, uh, it's hidden. You would never know it happened. Uh, and it could be as simple as I need to switch this for this. And it's just a, a quick little thing. There's no reveal. There's no trick. It's just a move. 
Uh, and I think that's actually the genius of it is the rest of us are waiting for the reveal and the reveal never happens. And that's how you hide it. I don't know it's if that makes sense. Uh, it does. And you mentioned the cheat and um, I, I forgot how he broke it down, but Spidey spent a little time and said, this is how you know that somebody's cheating in cards. And he just showed, he said, if you, how they're holding it. Mm -hmm. He said, you can tell a um, um, thousand times by how they hold the cards because to control it, you have to hold them in certain ways. There, there's an asterisk with that, which is a bad cheat. Yes. You, you're never going to know the good cheat cheated. You, you're just not there. They are. This is what they have done to make a living. So they're not going to hold the card in a certain way. They're not going to uh, do anything that will make you, th you know, a cheat. So this is this is actually really interesting. I, I'm fascinated with the world of cheats. There's a book called How to Cheat at Everything. It's by a guy named Simon Lovell. Uh, it's all about scams. And, and I was scammed as a kid when I was in, must have been 10th grade, yeah, 15, 14 years old. I was cheated in New York City. I went into the city with my friend Tamara. We were cheated. I, I cleared out my bank account for this game of chance that I was never going to win. And I remember that feeling of like, I was sitting on the curb, broke, sad like really like embarrassed and said, I would never cheat someone, okay? So I would never cheat someone because I experienced that, but I am fascinated with scams and stuff because of that. So a good scam, a good cheat, you're never gonna know. Magicians love to, for showmanship reasons, will say, here's how you can tell. Because what am I gonna say? There's nothing you can do, tough shit. <laughs> you know, that's, that's bad conversation. That's a stop. I would say other than the greats, Spidey is right. You are going to be able to tell based on how someone holds, because they're learning, a, they're a magician or they learned, they learned a, a, a sleight of hand move to cheat. To cheat at cards, you only need one tiny advantage. It's not, I'm going to win every time. It's, I'm changing the odds. That's how you cheat. You know, if someone's winning every time, if someone gets four aces, all of a sudden you go, this guy's cheating. But if they, you know, get a pair that's an ace, pair of aces, and you get a pair of jacks, if they get three of a kind once in a while and the pot is really big, all of a sudden they're winning without attracting attention. So it's not how they're holding the deck. It's they're holding their timing. You know, and you're not, you're not going to notice it. I think there's a lot of people that are sloppy. Um, there, there's a name, it's something, some guy's name basically where it says, you know, a little, therefore you think, you know, a lot, right? It's a, it's a, and they didn't, there we go. The, the Kruger thing. That's, that's how you catch a cheater. Yeah. I learned this couple of things and I'm a magician. I'm going to cheat at my cards with my friends. And most people do cheat by the way. Most people cheat at golf, they'll cheat at cards, they'll do something to get an advantage because we want to win as humans, right? So I learned this one little thing, I'm going to do it. If you are watching for that, you're going to catch the slop, the guy who knows just enough to make it work, but not enough to hide it well. That's what Spidey's talking about. And by the way, Spidey is one of the best, not cheater. Spidey is one of the best in his field of mentalism. Uh, you're, you're not being misled by him. He, if, if I was going to hire a mentalist or a psychic entertainer, I would hire Spidey. Yeah. He has a stellar reputation. In case for sure. watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll demand it. No. Um, well, and let's get on to that because I, I find this all fascinating and the cheating aspects and I'm, I'm, I, you I'm know, manipulation one, versus persuasion. I'm going to interrupt for one second. I, I do want to point out, I do believe, and I think what is the fascinating thing is, again, I said this at the very beginning, the truth within the artifice, the truth within the lie. Yes, the mentalist, the magician is using a technique to manipulate, to get the answer, but there is truth to it. The mentalist is 
getting lucky sometimes. The magician is getting lucky sometimes. Uh, so within all of this, the psychological aspects and all that, there is truth to the lie that we're presenting. Okay, this is, maybe this is a good analogy for it. I think it was um, Gene Siskel of Siskel and Ebert fame way back in the day. But Gene Siskel made this comment about stop motion animation versus CGI. And as he put it, stop motion animation looks fake but feels real. But CGI looks real but feels fake. Is this similar to what you're describing in that regard of the truth or not? Like stop motion animation it's really not a dinosaur or spaceship, but it is an actual object. It's something that is being moved around and it feels substantial and touchable to us versus CGI, which is a computer generated artifact, which we don't have any kind of relationship with in nature. Uh, I love that analogy. I think I'm gonna steal this and say it's mine and look at what I came up with. <laughs> this is great. Uh, magic is the CGI. You know it's fake. It looks real. The, the elephant appear. That, but you know on, an, on a molecular level, this is not real. David Copperfield is not really flying, right? Uh, stop motion is mentalism. I know this person is not reading my mind. But it really feels real because they got to the soul. Uh, the difference between CGI and, and stop motion is dirt. CGI will always be brand new. Because of the computer aspect, it will always be its first play. It's kind of like the difference between a record and a digital file. A record has a scratch to it. There's there's history in that record. There's patina. The the digital file will always be new. It has a tinniness to it. Uh, mentalism is messy. Mind reading, I have to get magic. I already know what you're going to say. I have a technique. It's a trick. It's a whatever. Mentalism, I have to kind of get past that first layer. I have to get some information to make it work. I have to do something. So uh, there's dirtiness to it. It doesn't feel, you know something's happening. Uh, I want you to think of a color, but only within this range. And, you know, I'm going to square the box. And you don't quite know how I did it, but you know something happened. But wow, that was amazing. How did you know what I was thinking? That's mentalism. Magic is, I have no idea how you did that. Great trick. You know. Okay, so while we're getting into the technique... Account. Awesome. Well, we're getting into the technique then. Um, cold reading and Barnum statements. Is that a fundamental factor to getting to these? And by that, and I'm going to give a definition and hopefully I get it correct. Um, these are statements that aren't really definitive. It, it, it's, a, it's thrown out at you like um, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. Or you have a tendency to be critical of yourself, which... Everybody is pretty much critical themselves, or these are so generalized that people can answer one way or the other, positive or negative, and then you can jump off of that. Is that part of what you are doing? Uh, the, it, it goes back to the magician and the cheat. Uh, the magician uses Barnum statements. The, the hack. I, I, and, and I don't mean hack in the sense that it's a, they're, they're not good at what they do. Uh, I think a Barnum statement is lazy. Uh, I do palm readings. I would never say to someone uh, a Barnum statement. I will, I will take an arrow and I will shoot. And I'm going for the bullseye. And I will look at you and I will make a statement. And I'm going to use my intuition, my instinct, and my experience. Three real things. I'll use my knowledge of human nature and 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 uh, there are psychological studies that are like you know ninety percent of people will have had these experiences throughout their lives. So I'll look at you and I'll say, okay, I'm looking at your palm, and I really am reading the palm because I'm justifying it with the lines. But I'll I'll try to find, you know, I'll look at the person and I'll say, okay, do you think this person had an early childhood health issue when you were? I'm going to say, oh, geez, I'm going to say before 15, probably when you were a kid, uh, I'm not going to say bro maybe broken bone, but I feel like there was something that kind of slapped you around a little bit and, and, and really changed 
the risks you were taking at that point before and you fell off a bike or something. I'm just getting that sense. And, you, and they're sitting there going, Oh my God. Yes. So I'm not saying a Barnum statement in the sense that, you know, wow, there was a childhood trauma. Well, that's a little broad. I'm saying you fell off a bike or this happened or that happened. I'm taking a big risk because if it's a no, you pivot. That's that was my question. So it, technically, it is a cold reading. It's technique, a cold though, reading. Right? So there's a difference between Barnum <clears throat> statements and cold readings. Cold readings. Remember what I said at the beginning? That spiral. You start at the mm -hmm. outside, and you're going for that bullseye. That's a cold. That's a real cold reading. Uh, and you're trying to get to the truth. You're not making broad statements. Uh, I think when you hear a Barnum statement, a hack statement. Instinctually, you know, oh, this can apply to anybody. Give me a break. You see, you know, when you hear something specific, uh, when you say something, especially when it's about health or love, money, whatever, health or love, and you get that specific, how the hell did you know that? Uh, I'll look at someone and I, I'll never forget I was the... I was the psychic consultant on a TV show. So I was helping them, helping the actors know how to do palm readings for television. I wasn't, you know, just here's what you would do for, in real life. Uh, who, uh, it was on Hulu. It was called Shut Eye. I was helping the actors. What does it look like to read palms? And I was talking to someone on the set. And obviously, I'm not about to reveal who this was. And they said, can you do a Every single person on that set got a palm reading. You know, they all wanted it. And the person came up to me and said, can you read my palm? And I looked at their palm and I just said, I'm going to make this real quick because it's about to get really dark. When you were 14, did you try to kill yourself? And she burst into tears and she go, how did you know that? And I said, here's the good news. You're here right now. I believe anything from the past you can bring up because they survived it. The fact that they're in this moment means they survived it. If she had said no, I would have pivoted, but my, my gut instinct was this was correct. It was a psychic moment. I don't know how else to describe it. You know, these things happen. That's not a Barnum statement. That's not, I sense that in your youth, you had a lot of confusion. No, that is a direct statement. I take that arrow, I shoot it. And I think people are afraid of that. I also do this for a living, so I'm doing it at least a hundred times a week at shows and whatnot. I'm talking to people. Uh, it is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. Uh, I do not suggest uh, an amateur magician goes up to someone and says, you tried to kill yourself when you were in there. I don't suggest that. Because uh, there is another element of that, which is the empathy element, which is doing it in a kind and caring and truly empathetic way, not doing it in a showy, uh, magician-y, psychic way. You know, there is a tr there is a technique more than just getting the information. But I don't believe in Barnum statements. I think they are transparent. Uh, I think we are smarter. Uh, the thing I learned doing this over 23 years is the audience is much smarter than we think they are. Uh, you can go on Google, you can go on TV, you can learn how these things are done within a second. You go on Reddit, hey, the magician did this, how's it done? And 20 people will give you answers. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but there's no mystery in the world. So going for the truth, going for the true mystery, this guy said something, this woman said something, and it was true. That's why mediums are so successful. They're not giving you Barnum statements. They're saying your mother called you something and it was her favorite word for you and it was a little fart. And you go, how the hell did they know my mother called me a little fart? There's, it must be real. Well, no, you know, there was a study done. People, they, they said, what are, what are names parents call children? Little fart, sunshine, sweetheart. There, there were like five. So start at the bazaar and then go back. Sweet. 
you know, your mother said little fart. No, no, hold on. And because you get that reaction. And then you go, okay, that didn't hit. Hold on, it's coming. She said she just had a little fart. She had gas in, in the buffet in heaven. Uh, <laughs> you know, you pivot. And then you say, uh, she's saying sweetheart. And then you see that. Okay, that's the word, sweetheart, because you got that reaction. Sweetheart, sweetheart, it's okay. Oh my God, the medium knew the name my mom called me. It was only my name. They wouldn't, you know what I mean? Uh, you know. Well, that's also recency bias too. I mean, right? You're kind of depending on that. Like if you get four things wrong on the way, but then you nail it on the fifth one. But that fifth That's going to be the most familiar. But that fifth one needs to be strong. Mm -hmm. If the five be, if, there's two elements to that. The first, uh, so I'm going to reveal something that I do in a, in a psychic setup. I fan, I fan a deck of cards. And I take one card and I place it on the table. I go, that's your card. That's your card. I then say, I want, uh, I, I want you to think of a card, right? So right now, not the Ace of Spades, think of a card. You got one in your mind? Okay. I was going to say the Seven of Hearts. But it's not. Right there is my first, is my first attempt. 30% eh, of the people say Seven of Hearts. So I say I was gonna say seven of hearts. Is it that high of a that percentage? Oh, you say that? I I do this. This is my go to, you know. Thing. Wow. Okay. What That's card? What card would you have said? No. Uh, what, what did I pick? Yeah. Uh, ten of hearts. Ten of hearts. The card on the table will be the ten of hearts. Oh, okay. Because that's what I've already seen. It's no, uh, no, 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 no. Because I can. I have ways of making it be the ten of hearts. Oh, okay. So uh, the, the sleight of hand will come into effect. Yes. But when that seven of hearts hits, I just move that card back. You forget about it. That's the recency bias. You, I, I hit your card by saying, I was going to say seven of hearts. Oh, my God. How did you know that? Yoink. <laughs> that, that card goes back in quick because I hit it. Or I say to the next person, great. Now you think of a card. What's that card, right? That's recency bias. The effect is so much more powerful than the misses. If I were to say to you, uh, I'm gonna tell you about your past. Okay, boy, you had a traumatic childhood. No, I had a really great home. I grew up in Iowa, classic. Okay, ooh. Uh, well, uh, you've had a lot of money issues recently. No, you know, I hit the lottery when I was 21. I've been set for life. Okay. okay. Uh, you can't find love. You know, you, you, I've been married since I was 18. Happy marriage, three kids. What is it? I don't care what I say. I can, I can tell you the name of your, 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 you know, your, your firstborn. Uh, those three already ruined it. I've, I, I've had three massive failures. The, you, you'll, I'll give you the last one and you'll go, yeah, you got that one. Now, if I have three misses, but I'm really good at what I do, you're never going to know they're a miss because of how it's. Well, they're hard. tiny. I'm sure they're, they're tiny. Not even that they're tiny. In impact. Phrased. Mm. Okay. I'm getting the sense in your, in your youth, some sort of trauma. No, nope. I grew up in a, a great home. No, it's not that. It's not that. It's um, it's a moment. It's a moment you may not even know about it. It's um, some 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 sort of embarrassment in in like gym class or something that you didn't even think think about. No, you know what? It's gonna come back to you. Right? Not not now. I'm getting this. It's a, it's a it's a hidden. All of a sudden, I've taken that loss. I've never had trauma. I grew up in a. Yeah, it's not, well, you're not going to realize it now, but in, in a couple, and I'll tell you the amount of times I do that and they write back and, they, and and at the end they go, oh my God, you're talking about that. I haven't thought about that in years. How the hell, do, you know, no, it wasn't that I knew that it was a feeling. It was something underneath. I got the sense that's your loss to a hit. That's a psychic, you know, you're at my crystal ball here. I'm looking in the crystal ball. I'm getting the sense we are in the world of magic. You are seeing, and I, and again, it's not a negative. You're seeing the hack version. You're seeing the guy who read a book on cold reading for magicians, gives you Barnum statements, and you walk away and you go, "That's okay." 
There's a reason why psychics are really good at what they do. There's a reason why people get scammed. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because these people are really good at what they do. When all to be fair, to be fair, isn't everyone a hack at one point? It's a journey. Not every band is successful. They all do open mics, just like comedians. Most start with open nights. They don't have an identity of their own. They don't really attain the skill level until they put in the reps, the audience, the feel, things like that. I think you either got it or you ain't. And when you see someone who's doing an open mic night for the first time, they may be doing someone else's material. They may bomb, but there's something inside of them where you go, that guy's got it. That woman's got it. That person's got it. It's a, it's a, it's an intangible element of who they are. So the joke may bomb, but you kind of want to watch them do it again. Maybe a different joke this time. I think the, the first time I did a cold reading, I was on a date. The person I was with went, what is the psychic thing? And I said, oh, do you want me? I'm learning this. Do you want me to show you what it looks like? And they go, oh, okay. And I looked at the person sitting next to us, this delightful young lady. And I said, I'm, I'm learning about psychic stuff. Can I, can I do a reading? And she went, okay. We were at a bar. It was a very bizarre place to do this. And within about three minutes, she was crying because I was hitting those, I was getting those hits. I wasn't great. If I looked back on it, I would have done it very differently. I would have been a little more empathetic. I would have been a more careful. I would have followed a different path. Uh, I do think hitting those bullseyes at the first hit are not the best idea. You do want to get there a little bit. There is a process. But not to pat myself on the back, I had it. From I, I wasn't good, but I had that thing that you can't teach. I can teach you technique. I can teach you the secrets. I can teach you the trick. I can't teach you how to be likable. I can't teach you how to be engaging. Uh, it's why two magicians who do the same trick, the exact same trick, word for word, one is going to be the most incredible. Why David Blaine will do a store-bought trick and it will be the most incredible thing you've ever seen and the kid from down the street does it or Bob, your uncle, does it and you go, eh. yeah, but when David Blaine did that, that was amazing. And you go, it's the same trick. No, it's it's the same trick, but the performance was different. The person was different. That's the thing. So with a psychic, um, I've, I've gone to a few psychics and I want to go to more, but when you go to see a real person, uh, it is incredible because they're not putting on a show. They're not doing magic tricks. Uh, it's very matter of fact. It's very real. It's very simple. Uh, magicians can learn a lot by, by watching someone who's real do it. Uh, they take away a lot of the showmanship. It goes back to that thing about the, uh, cheat. The cheat doesn't do anything other than that one thing really well. Uh, the magician holds the, you know, yeah, if someone's holding the cards in a very specific way, they they might be cheating. But the cheat's not going to do that because they do that one thing really well. They take away the show. That's what a psychic does. They take away the show. They take away the magic trick and they just go for the real. Well, this is perfect. I'm going to wrap up with a hacky move of my own. And rather than guessing on my part, what is the one question that I should have asked you, but I did not? How do they find me? How do they find you? <laughs> uh, it's very simple. Go to my website. It's www.mentalist.show, not mentalist.com, mentalist.show. Uh, there's a contact form. There's a video. There's information about what I do. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the greatest thing that I think I can do for people. It's being available. Um, I get a lot of emails from people who say, you know, uh, hey, I'm thinking of going to a site. I want a reading. I want this. Send me a note. 
I'll, I'll send you to the right person. I'll, I'll tell you who to go to. It may not be, it probably won't be me. I don't do individual readings. I do shows. So I'll do a party, but not a person. And, you know, reach out to someone, get, get second thoughts. Um, and again, uh, if I can leave your viewers with anything, it's this. If you're thinking of going to a psychic, if you're thinking of going to a medium, if it's for fun, if it's for closure, if it's for just to see what it's about, knock yourself out. If you're going a second, third, fourth time because you were told to, if you're going a second, third, fourth time, uh, that's where it becomes predatory. That's the red line for me. Uh, go see a therapist. <laughs> that <laughs> Not can because be you're going back to a psychic, too. but because that person's trained. You know, they've gone to school for this. The psychic just has spoken to a lot of people. But if you're going once or twice, it's fun. It's, you know, knock yourself out. All right. Perfect note. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Eric. And, and thank you, everybody else. Mentalist.show. <laughs>